Well, good morning. My name is Ryan Diffenderfer. Um, I guess I should share a little bit about myself to see who is this stranger that stands before you today. Um, I am the youth pastor at New Life Bible Fellowship. And in fact, I was actually scheduled to be the uh, guest speaker next week. Um, but Elder Todd Heath, who will be here with you next week, hopefully, called me at 6 o'clock last evening with the flu and asked me if I could pull a switch. Um, and so in Bible college, you always dream of these scenarios or think about these scenarios or they tell you to be prepared, you know. Uh, but when it comes at 6 o'clock the night before and I was driving out to play disc golf in Boyertown, I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, I am not sure about this. But, um, but anyways, I am here. And, and so I have, I have a wife, Melanie. We've been married 11 years to this coming December. I have four children, um, nine, seven, five, and three. I know, I know, I look too young to have four children, um, but it's, it's true, uh, and so people ask me what I do on my free time. Well, when you have four children under the age of 10, I don't have such a thing as free time, uh, so I usually spend it with my children or at home with my wife. Um, and so the family that I know the most here actually were the Timpies. Uh, our children do homeschool co-op with them together. I see that Nick loves me so much that he decided not to show up this Sunday morning. Uh, you can let them know that I said that. But anyways, this morning, why I'm really here is I consider it a high privilege to always open God's word, and I do not consider it lightly to preach God's word. And so this morning, we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, having been put on the call the last minute, uh, I had not yet started to prepare for next week's lesson. I was actually not going to preach, ideally, from Isaiah 7. Um, but I was at youth camp up until Wednesday of this week, so... I did not have time to look at anything new, and then not knowing that I was preaching this Sunday, I am preaching a sermon that I preached at our church in July, and that's from Isaiah chapter 7. But before we get there, I likely need to give you guys a little bit of context about what's going on in Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet, um, hopefully we know that, and Isaiah's job was to deliver the word of the Lord. Isaiah, though, was a prophet at a time when Israel... Um, was going to face judgment. In fact, the first five chapters of Isaiah tell us of the upcoming judgment that is going to happen amongst the nation of, well, actually, Israel and Judah are divided at this point, and so Judah was going to come under judgment, and Isaiah was to deliver that message. But in Isaiah chapter 6, as likely we have all known or heard in probably one of the most famous passages of Isaiah, we see in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is taken up before the Lord. He gets a vision of the heavenlies. And in fact, so amazing, in verse 3 it says, one of the angels was saying to the other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And what a picture, one that we would all dream to behold. In Isaiah it says, the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And Isaiah recognized something. He said, woe is me, for I am lost, and for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah recognizes something that I am not worthy to be standing here. So it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in the hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And we have a beautiful picture of Isaiah's sin being atoned for and Isaiah in the presence of the Lord. And then maybe some sobering news for Isaiah. Because look with me in verse 8. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Well, here I am. Send me. And he said, Go and say to my people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And we see here Isaiah has a message. And in fact, this message is going to be keep preaching, keep proclaiming. The people aren't going to hear and they aren't going to listen. And that brings us to Isaiah chapter 7. Have you guys ever been in a situation where you know something to be true? You believe it, you know it, and you're left to try to persuade someone else that it is true, and they're adamant that it is not true. I'm the father of four children, I know this very well. In fact, a couple months ago, my son had banged his elbow, 
and he was convinced that he had a concussion of the elbow. He adamantly, through arguments with his mother, um, was trying to persuade her and convince her that the concussion of an elbow, despite showing him what a concussion was, despite teaching him what a concussion was, he was adamant that his elbow had experienced a concussion. He refused to believe that that was not such a thing. Well, this morning we're going to take a look at a man, Ahaz, um, and Isaiah had the ministry of trying to deliver to him a message that Ahaz would refuse to believe. And for sake of, I don't want to be redundant, but I do want to look at the text again. Let's look back at Isaiah chapter 7. It says, In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, Rezin the king of Syria, and Pekah the son of Ramaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. And let's see if I can use this rightly. Oh, no. I did not include the slide of the image that I wanted to decide. All right, so I hope to have an image up here of exactly what was going on. But so Israel and Judah had divided, right? The 10 tribes had gone, the two tribes of Judah were left, and Israel and Syria were launching an attack against Judah. They were coming for their land. They were coming to hopefully take over the land of Judah. So we look at verse 2. It says, When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, right? They had tag-teamed against Judah. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So the Lord gives Isaiah a message. He says, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Sher Joshua, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the washer's field. And say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear. And do not let your heart be faint, because these two smoldering stumps of firebrands, at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramalia, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia have devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as the king in the midst of it. And so what do we have here? We have Judah under a real attack. This isn't fake. This isn't um, a hoax. This isn't just an empty threat. They're coming. Syria and Israel are coming for Judah. And so what is Ahaz going to do? Well, Ahaz kind of responds like anyone does when they receive news that isn't, here's $200 for passing go. We know that he's in fear, that he's in terror. It says that he's shaking like the trees in verse 3, as the forest shakes before the wind. And where do we find him? We find him by the highway to the washer's field. What is that? That's the water source. He's protecting the water source. He's doing everything that he can in his human reasoning, his human power of what can I do to make sure that I protect my people? And so he's taking a very human approach to a human threat. How can I protect my resources? How can I protect my city? And we say, well, that seems reasonable, right? What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that Isaiah says to him in verse 4, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint, because these two smoldering stumps of firebrands, saying, you know the threats of Syria, you know the threats of Israel, don't be alarmed, don't be dismayed, be quiet, because what are they like? They're like two smoldering stumps. They're going to pass away, they're going to burn out, they're going to fade out. They aren't a threat to you. Syria and Israel's fate is sealed. You know the outcome. And he's telling Ahaz what the outcome of them is going to be. Let me ask you something. How would you like to walk into... Well, how about this? You're going to walk into work. Let's say you're working tomorrow. And you're going to walk into work and you're going to ask for a raise. Well, you're probably unsure of how that conversation is going to go. But what if on Friday, in the copier, you saw a memo that said... if Bob asked for a raise. This is what you're approved to give Bob up to, right? You walk into that meeting with a whole lot more confidence and saying, you know what? I'm going to ask for that raise because you know the outcome. You know that it is going to be given to you. Or I joked with our congregation, you know, how many of you have ever had an argument with your spouse? It's like, you know, it's going to take 30 minutes to get there. No, it doesn't take 30 minutes to get there. No, it's going to take 30 minutes to get there, right? And so the next time that you drive there, you pull out your phone, you time it, and it took you 31 minutes to get there. And how prepared are you and how confident are you the next time you had that conversation that it's like, I know that it took me 31 minutes to get there. 
That's what's happening here. He's telling Ahaz, listen, their outcome is sealed. Their fate is sealed. Trust and believe in what I am telling you. And so we ask, though, why does Ahaz need this address? Why is God reminding him about that? Well, because Ahaz has joined his heart to another, right? I wish I could have it on a map, right? You'd have Israel here, you'd have Syria here, and then beyond on geographically, you'd have Assyria. And Ahaz has already gone behind the Lord and joined himself to Assyria. Assyria is his big brother. Assyria is what is going to save him. He's, looked, he's going to link himself to Assyria and hopes that that is what will save Judah. And so we have here, um, it says, And King Ahaz cut off the frames of the stands and removed the basin from them. And he took down the seat from the bronze oxen that were under it and put it on the stone pedestal. And the covered way for the Sabbath that he had built inside the house and the outer entrance for the king, he caused to go around the house of the Lord because of the king of Assyria. He was mutilating God's temple for the sake of offering it to the king of Assyria. And Second Chronicles 28, 21, it says, For Ahaz took a portion from the house of the Lord and the house of the king of the princes and gave tribute to the king of Assyria, but it did not help him. You see, Ahaz had trusted Assyria to be his functional savior. What was going to deliver him, what was going to rescue him, what was going to bring him peace in that moment wasn't the Lord. He had put his hope in Assyria. And we do the same thing each and every day. We have things that operate as our functional savior, things that we look to on the day ins and the day outs of our life to bring us meaning, purpose, significance, our salvation, so to speak. We have all kinds of things that we look to to deliver us as opposed to looking to the Lord. And you say, well, come on, Ahaz, get it together. Shouldn't Ahaz have known that the Lord would fight his battles? In fact, doesn't it say in Joshua 10 and 8, right? Ahaz would know this. It says, and the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear him, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came up to them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Ezekiah and Makeda. Like, doesn't the Lord, doesn't Ahaz know that the Lord fights for his people? Doesn't he know that the Lord can deliver and bring victory over other nations? Doesn't he remember in 1 Samuel, where it says, And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel takes a nursing lamb and he offers it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel and the Lord answered him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and he threw them into confusion and they were defeated before Israel. Doesn't Ahaz know that God fights? Shouldn't he have known that David, a little shepherd's boy, with the slingshots and millstones, or river stones, can walk out into a battle and defeat the giant Goliath. Why? Because the Lord fights for his people. Doesn't he know that these nations can only do what God permits, what God allows and ordains, and he has said that they have reached a limit. In fact, look at with me at verse 7. It shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. What's he saying here? What's the point of this? He's saying that if you boil this down, what's behind Syria? It's just a weak little man named resin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. What is this? Behind Israel, Ephraim... It's just a little man. And he says, if you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. And so Alec Montier calls this Ahaz's trust or bust moment. I titled my message to believe or not to believe, and Ahaz is brought to the point of this. You're either going to believe in the promises of God and the things that God has spoken, or 
you will not be firm at all, which means you will be removed. You're either going to trust in what God has spoken and what God has done, or you will bust. And if that were me, and it were, sorry, if I am the Lord in that situation, that would be enough, right? I have spoken. I have told you what is going to happen. I've told you the outcome. And so now it's up to you to trust. But the Lord is not only going to speak it. Let's look at verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Right? What does he want for Ahaz? He wants Ahaz to trust. He wants Ahaz not to look to Assyria. He wants Ahaz to believe in him and to trust that he can deliver him from the hands of these two nations. And so he says to Ahaz in verse 11, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. What kind of sign can I ask for? He says, Well, let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Think about that. God comes and he doesn't make a request here. He doesn't say, Ahaz, if you want to take advantage, you can ask for a sign and I will show it to you. It's a command. Think about previously. When Moses was approached by the Lord and said, go to Pharaoh, what does Moses do? Moses himself asked for a sign and God gives the sign. When he comes to Gideon and wants Gideon to fight the Midianites, what does Gideon say? Lord, I need a sign. In fact, he asked for a couple signs and what does God do? God grants the request. Here, Ahaz doesn't even have to ask for it. God commands him and tells him, ask me for a sign because I'm willing to show you that I will fight for you and I will defend you. And so you can ask anything. And in fact, from Sheol to as high as heaven, basically there is nothing off the table that you can't ask that I won't do to demonstrate that I am willing to save. And we go, oh, come on, Ahaz, right? Like, you got to get it here, right? But the question before us is, are we any better than Ahaz? Do we have things in our life that God has promised that we fail to trust? And where does our unbelief manifest itself? Hasn't God promised and communicated to us that he will care for our tomorrows, our food, and our clothing? Yet how often are we tempted to worry about the material things and about our tomorrows as if the Lord is not sovereign over them? Or how much does our unbelief show itself when there's a problem or a situation or a solution and it's saying, you know what, and our pride shows itself and I want to figure this out, I want to handle it, and I refuse to turn to the Lord to seek his wisdom and to seek his face, and I got to be the solution to this problem? Where has suffering pain and the trials of this life afflicted us to where I doubt God's goodness and his care for me. Even though there's numerous scriptures that remind me that he will never leave me, that he will never forsake me, and that he will work all things according to my good, and that he has graciously given us all things. Or for where have I wrestled with a certain sin in my life that's been dominant, and I think I'm never going to be free of this. I can never get over this. This is always going to be in my life and I fail to believe that the Lord can deliver and the Lord can rescue. And I fail to believe the promises of Romans 8.1 that therefore if anyone is in Christ, there is no condemnation. Where in my marriage, my parenting, my work, have I wrestled for control or have been riddled with fear, forgetting that the Lord is sovereign over all? You see, we all have things that function as our savior or our mechanism for bringing peace, stability, and comfort into our lives. Will we believe? Will we trust? And so we see here that Ahaz is faced with the question, ask for a sign, it's a command, and I am willing to do it. And I think initially we go, please, Lord, pick me, right? I'll, I'll be Ahaz, I'll ask for a sign. I have a million things that I could ask for, right? And we kind of want to be Ahaz. We think that he is the one in the million situation. It's like, God, please, if, if you were to ask me that, I would ask something and, I, and you could show me and then I would finally believe, right? Right, you know, how many of us have prayed the prayer, God, if you strike lightning right now or God, you do this right now, then I know that I will believe and I'll put my faith and I'll put my trust in you. And we say, what an opportunity, But the reality is we don't want to be Ahaz. Ahaz is so dead to the Lord, so far from understanding that what God is doing 
that he ignores the command. Let's look at verse 12. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. You see, we often think that our unbelief or our lack of faith is tied to, if I just were to see another sign, if I just were to witness a miracle, if I just were to get to behold Jesus physically with my own eyes, then I would believe. But let me ask you this. The Pharisees, did they not see enough miracles? Did they not hear? They just needed to hear a little bit more convincing teaching from Jesus. They just needed to behold him a little bit more. Jesus just needed to affirm it in another way. Was their unbelief tied to what they saw or what they heard? No, unbelief isn't tied to those things. Unbelief is tied to the hardness of our hearts and the idols of our hearts and the things that our hearts cling to. And so they didn't need just a little bit more exposure. And so what does Ahaz do? He covers it up with a nice little pious answer. Oh, I will not ask. I know that I can't put the Lord to the test. Listen. You're never testing the Lord when he gives you a command to do something and you fail to obey it. That's not a test, right? The test is, are you going to obey the command? And so what does Ahaz do? He starts to twist the scripture for his own advantage. Well, who does that? Well, that's the work of Satan. But once again, I want to remind us that there's a little bit of Ahaz in us all, right? Right? Have we ever said something to the effects of these two things? You know, I can't serve in ministry blank because I've done that for X amount of years and now I want to do this ministry. Meanwhile, I'm signed up for zero ministries and doing nothing and I just have to have a nice little excuse so that way I can get out of serving where I don't want to serve and be uncomfortable. Or how about this? I can't share my faith at work or with my neighbors because, you know, I need this job to provide for my family and God wants me to provide for my family and he would not want me to lose this job and so therefore um, I can't take that kind of risk in publicly sharing and declaring my faith. And so I've got to have a nice little pious answer to cover up the big fact that I'm just a spiritual chicken. And I like my comfort and my ease and my schedule and the real reason I won't share my faith is not because... I'm worried about losing anything. It's because I'm worried about protecting myself. You see, Ahaz had already given his heart to another. He had already placed his faith in Assyria. And so he needed some type of reason to out, instead of outright saying, you know what, God, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. I trust Assyria more than I trust you. He had to say, you know what? I'm not going to ask. I don't want to put the Lord to the test. In verse 13, how does the Lord respond? He says, Hear, O then, Israel, O David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? In response to that, in verse 14, he says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. And hopefully for some of us, that sparks your ears and say, I think I've heard that before, right? You know, somewhere around Christmas time, we read this verse. I've heard that before. But I'm going to read the next couple of verses, and I want you, because I think there's two meanings to this sign. And we often think of that meaning, that's the birth of Jesus, that's the coming of the Lord, that's our King being born, that's the incarnate deity. But I want to first look at the verses, and I want you to answer this question as we read. Is this first sign a good thing or a bad thing? Is this a sign of promise, hope, and blessing to the Israelites, or is it a sign of the opposite? I want you to answer silently as I read the following verses. The son, he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you will dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. And that day the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep, settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rock and on all the thorn bushes and on all the pastures. And that day the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away with the beard also. Let's jump down to verse 23. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, 
they will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. And all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of the briars and the thorns, but they will become a place where the cattle are let loose and where the sheep tread. What is that? That's a sign of the judgment that is coming. Assyria is coming. In fact, it says in verse 20, how bad is it going to be? In that day, the Lord will shave with the razor that is hired beyond the river, the head and the hair of the feet. Think about that. Assyria is going to take captive of you so much so that they're able to just shave you bald and you have no power to stop them. Ultimate humiliation. And we see here this first Mark of the sign is a sign of judgment. That because Ahaz refuses to believe, the Lord's saying, you know what? You won't believe, you won't ask for a sign, but I'm going to give you a sign that'll testify. And it's first a sign of judgment. This is what is going to come. And it's a reminder to us that unbelief does not go unpunished. I don't just get to say, you know what, God, I don't believe in the signs, I don't believe in the things that you've given, I haven't trusted in you, and I don't get to just reap the rewards as if I had believed. In fact, you know, we don't operate like this. We don't say, you know, you don't have to believe in any of society's laws or morals, you don't have to believe in things such as work and all of that, and you get to reap the rewards of those things. I mean, unless you're Joe Biden, right? But, um, you know, But we don't say that. We don't say to our children, you don't have to follow any of the rules at home. You don't have to believe in any of the family values that we have. You don't have to believe in any of those things, and they still reap the rewards of those things. Our God is just. Our God does what is right. No one has to teach him what is right. And so in his justice and his righteousness, he punishes sin, and he punishes unbelief. But there's a second thing that I think that we can learn from this judgment. What was the thing that Ahaz believed was going to save him. It was Assyria. And what is the very thing of how God brings judgment? Assyria. And so brothers and sisters, I think there's a lesson here is this, that if the thing that I am not trusting in, if the thing I'm trusting in is not the Lord Jesus Christ, that thing can also be my destruction and my ruin. What do I mean by that? Let me give a few examples. You say, if I live for the approval of others, I live by the opinions and the words and the thoughts of others, and I want that to be my joy and my trust and how others view me and what others say about me and what others affirm about me, my professor put it this way, is that if you live by what people say about you, you'll also die by what people say about you. You see, if the goal of your life is to provide the perfect life for your children, for your grandchildren, you give them everything, and all your hope in life is that they would just be successful, and that would be the culmination of a successful life for you, what happens when one of those children does not walk in the way that you had planned for them? Or what happens when they veer off course? Does your joy, your peace, and your purpose in life remain steadfast? Or do I come to a crumbling mess? Listen, you can fill in that blank with anything. Marriage, success, financial security. You see, if any of those things that we turn to be our functional savior, to deliver us, to save us, to give us purpose, meaning, and hope, and I trust in that, that that is going to give me what I need, and it is not the Lord Jesus Christ, then it often can be the thing that destroys me, that crushes my hope and my joy. My treasure is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so first we see that it's a sign of judgment to the nation of Israel at that time. But we also know what? But we also know that this is a sign of hope. Think about that for a second. Here's Israel refusing to believe Here's God's people refusing to ask for a sign. And what does God say? You're not going to ask for a sign, but I'm going to give you one anyways. And we see that fulfillment in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, 700 years before Matthew wrote that, Isaiah prophesied, and God planned and God purposed that despite of the unbelief of his own people, God was going to give birth to a son. And Matthew tells us that it's a sign for us. What was the sign to Ahaz? The sign was to trust and believe that God could deliver and that God could rescue. And Jesus is a sign for us too, that he is the one that saves. And so we ask, what comfort does this bring us? Well, if the goal of the garden was that we would walk and commune and have fellowship with the Lord, and that we would live in the presence of the Lord, that Adam and Eve shared unhindered fellowship with him, and that what God required of man was that man walk in righteousness and man walk in holiness, and, God, and we would walk as God intended. And that's what was required of us, but we failed to meet that requirement whenever we sinned and rebelled and rejected God's long command, and we were kicked out of fellowship. And now I can't do what God requires. I can't be who God requires. The comfort that that brings us is this, is that the God who I cannot share fellowship with, who I cannot be in the presence of, steps down into my humanity, walks onto my earth to come and dwell with us. And therefore, what I couldn't do, the holiness that I couldn't fulfill, he fulfills by walking in a perfect obedience to the Father. And God provides in the person of Jesus Christ the requirements so that Jesus would be the perfect substitute to offer himself on the cross to lay down his own life so that the sin that I deserve to pay would be paid by Christ. And you see a beautiful picture of the gospel that what God requires, God provides. And how does he provide it? In his son, Jesus Christ. And in that, I can now share in fellowship with the with the Lord because my sin has been paid for and I've been granted the righteousness of Christ. That's why Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I'm invited into the fellowship. I can enter the Holy of Holies because of Jesus. So this morning, just as Ahaz faced the question of standing firm, will he trust or will he believe the Lord to deliver, the same question remains of us. Will I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that my greatest need in this life is not a bigger bank account, not the right relationship, not personal satisfaction, not a new job, not more well-behaved kids, not a more enjoyable social life, but rather I need to be delivered and rescued from my sin because there's some Ahaz in me. Because I've chosen to rebel against God's commands, I've rejected his truth, and I live according to my own wisdom and to my own knowledge as if I were in charge. And I need my life to be redeemed from the pit because I've loved darkness more than I've loved the light. And I need to believe that deliverance does not come through a personal effort. It does not come through sheer power. It does not come through my family heritage. It does not come through my church attendance. It does not come through moral living, but it comes through the one that was born of a virgin and that was born to save his people from their sin. And that's why it says, if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. And so this morning, I would call you to this. Maybe, well, I don't want to skip over it. If you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, then today is your trust robust moment. Would you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Would you believe that Jesus is the Son of God sent to live the life that you could not live and die the death that you deserve to die so that you could experience the forgiveness of sins and eternal life with him? But for those of us that have confess that and have walked with the Lord 
would we check our hearts to where unbelief has crept in, to where doubt has crept in, to where we've looked to functional saviors to give us what only Christ could give us? And would we repent of our sins and would we believe in the one that God has sent to deliver and rescue us? I close with this. When we think our, tight, our sermon series at New Life was called All Us. We were looking at Isaiah and looking at the things that would leave us in all. And so I end with what would leave us in all here this morning. When we think of it, a rebellious people that were worshiping another God, that were pursuing other avenues of salvation, that rejected God's command, that failed to trust the Lord for deliverance, amidst a people that were filled with unbelief, Romans 5.8 says this, while yet we were still sinners, while we were yet walking in the opposite direction, Christ died for us. That he promised a sign to us to deliver us so that we might share in fellowship with him. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that despite our unbelief, despite the hardness of our own hearts. Father, despite our temptations to trust and believe in other things, Father, you loved us so much and you demonstrated that love by dying for us while we were yet sinners. Father, if you were to wait for us to make it right, or if you were to wait for us to have the right thoughts and the right attitudes and right living, Father, there would be no such thing as salvation. And so, Father, we thank you that you purposed it and that you accomplished it in the giving of your Son. And so this morning here at Kutztown Bible Fellowship, would we believe and would we trust in the sign that has been given for us? In Jesus' name.